So, so we're, in, uh, we're in the book of Isaiah again tonight. Uh, we're going to pick up in chapter 7. The title of the message is, What's in a Name? We'll, and we'll get into that here shortly. But last week, um, if you were with us or if you watched online, you may remember last week we saw King Uzziah uh, after reigning for about 52 years died, right? After reigning for 52 years, his reign and his life came to an end. And so for over half a century, uh, the people of Judah had been able to, uh, had been able to, to depend on Uzziah, right? He was a mostly solid, steady, decent king. And so they had been able to depend on him for over half a century, uh, and only when things were just thrown into total chaos and, uh, you know, there were a lot of questions, who's going to be in charge and who's going to lead us now and all of that. That's when uh, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord, right? And he had this encounter with the Lord. And there's a lesson there just that, you know, that uh, part of growing in our faith is, is having those that we depend on taken from us. Uh, in part so that we learn to depend on God. That's just part of the, the natural cycle of our life and our faith. You know, and it's a hard, it's a difficult lesson no matter what age you learn it in. Uh, so anyway, so in chapter 7, uh, we're going to look at uh, the reign of Ahaz. This is Uzziah's um, grandson. So some time has passed since, since the previous chapter. Uh, before we get into it, let's go ahead and ask the Lord to help us understand it. We'll go to him in prayer. Okay. Uh, Lord, we thank you so much for allowing us to gather together tonight, uh, that you've preserved your word for us, that we can look at it and see uh, the truth of how you've been revealing yourself to us for centuries. We can see the truth of who you are and who we can be in you. Uh, Lord, we just pray for your blessing on the message tonight, that eyes and, and hearts would be open. Uh, Lord, that uh, whatever... Whatever uh, outside voices we've been listening to that have been clouding our judgment, that those would just be pushed away for this time that we're gathered together and that we can hear your voice and know you better after this message than we did before. Well, we pray for your blessing and we pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right, let's get into it. Isaiah 7, verse 1. It says, Now it came about in the days of Ahaz the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, uh, that Rezan, the king of Aram, and Aram, uh, sometimes you'll, depending on your translation or depending on which book in the Old Testament you're reading, it may refer to them as Syria. Uh, but Aram, the Aramites, and Syria are the, are the same country. Then there's this other country north of them that's a lot bigger called Assyria. So that can be confusing. The Syrians and the Assyrians are not the same, not the same people. And so uh, in the, I'm reading out of the NASB, they call them Aram instead of Syria. So that's a little bit easier to track. So reason the king of Aram and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not conquer it. When it was reported to the house of David, saying, uh, the Aramaeans have camped in Ephraim, his heart and the hearts of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake with the wind. So there's a bunch of names in there. Incidentally, if, uh, you know, if you're pregnant or you got, uh, you know, you're thinking about having a baby, there's going to be all kinds of great biblical names in this message tonight. So we've already got Reason and Pika, right? Ramaliah. It's a great Bible names. So, so word gets to, uh, to Ahaz that there's this, this confederacy, this, this um, axis of, uh, of enemies that have been formed against him, right? So you've got Aram and you've got uh, Ramaliah, the king of Israel, uh, or the, it also refers to them as Ephraim. That can be confusing. Ephraim is just the name of one of the tribes of Israel. And at this time, they are the largest tribe. right? So it was, it was just a way of referring to 
that whole northern kingdom of, of ten uh, tribes, you could basically refer to all of them as Ephraim, because Ephraim was as big as the other nine combined. And so they're, they're, they're marching toward Jerusalem. They're marching toward uh, the southern kingdom of Judah, uh, and, and the people begin to shake like leaves on a tree, you know. They're, they're spooked. The people are scared. Verse 3, it says, Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and your son, here's a great Bible name, Shear Jeshub. Uh, that name means a remnant shall return. Isaiah, he has some kids, and all of his kids have very significant meaning to their names. Um, you know, there's a lot, a lot can be, there's a lot in a name, right? Some of you may have spent a long time trying to live down your name, all right? I come from a very large family, and I remember one time I met this guy that was from the same uh, town that my, uh, my dad and Virgil were from, and uh, yeah, we get to talking, and you know, we're, we're like, oh, yeah, I know that guy, and you know this guy. And he goes, so you're Mosley. He goes, my dad always told me when there's a Mosley around, somebody's either going to get whipped or somebody's going to get preached at. And he goes, which are you? And I said, well, let's see how the day goes. You know, let's see how it goes from here. But, you know, you may have had to live down a name, right? Or maybe you're, uh, you know, you're trying to build up a name. You're, 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 you're trying to, um, you know, establish a, a, new, a new lineage for your family. I remember hearing this story one time about a guy, uh, Charlie Stink. And Charlie, his whole life, people gave him, you know, picked on him, made fun of him for his name. And one day, you know, at work... Uh, or for weeks at work, people were telling him, you know, Charlie, you should, you should change your name. You know, it's easy to do. You go down to the courthouse, fill out some papers, and, you know, you're tired of everybody making fun of you. It's easy. Go change your name. So one day, Charlie came in and came into work. He, he says, well, guys, I, I did it. I, I changed my name, although I'm not sure what good it's going to do. And they're like, well, what'd you change it to? He goes, well, now my name's George Stink, but I don't... <laughs> I don't, I don't know what the difference is, but <laughs> anyway, all right. So Shear Jashub, right? This, this name, it means a remnant shall return, and that is significant. So God tells Isaiah, I want you to go meet Ahaz, but I want you to take your son with this name that has this meaning to it. Uh, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. Okay, so what that means is Ahaz, the king, they're potentially going to be in battle or under siege soon, and he is out inspecting his aqueduct system, his water supply. And that's a practical thing. It's not a wrong thing for a king to do, right? But if you're, you're the king of Judah, where the, the temple of God is, and you have the prophet Isaiah living in the same town. Why is not your first move to go talk to Isaiah or go to the temple? Right? He, Ahaz doesn't do either one of those. And the prophet has to go seek him out. And that's, there, there's, a lot, there's a lot right there. You know, that, that's what we do, right? We, when trouble comes our way, we talk to our attorney or an accountant or we go look it up on some Reddit forum or, you know, we, we ask for advice before we ever go to the Lord about it. So Isaiah goes to meet him uh, in verse 4. It says, now say to him, take care and be calm. Have no fear and do not be faint-hearted because of these two Stubs of smoldering firebrands on account of the fierce anger of reason and Aram and the son of Remaliah, 
Because Aram with Ephraim, or with Israel, uh, and the son of Ramaliah has planned evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and terrorize it and make for ourselves a breach in its walls and set up the son of Tabeel as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand. Right? They have these plans, it's not going to happen. It shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is reason. Right? He's, he's saying, you know, these, these guys serve people too, right? They, they have people over them. And, and now within another 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered so that it is no longer a people. So this other kingdom that's trying to invade his kingdom within half a century or so is going to be taken away into captivity. Verse 9, and the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Ramaliah. Now here's the trick. He says, if you will not believe, you surely shall not last. God puts a little condition on this promise, right? He says, all these plans they're making against you, they're not going to come to pass. But there is a condition, right? I, I've already promised that they're not going to defeat Jerusalem. They're not going to take my holy temple and my holy city. But if you will not believe, you shall not last. And it's a really interesting phrase in the Hebrew because the word here for believe and last are actually the same word. Uh, and it, the closest way that word translates into English or the way the sentence translates into English would be like, if you will not support this, then you will not be supported. Right? If, if you don't get strength from what I'm saying, I'm not going to strengthen you. You know, God doesn't want us walking around just freaking out over everything, every little thing that happens in our lives. Living... Uh, in anxiety and doubt. Over, one, of the, one of the commands that appears most in Scripture is do not what? Fear. Do not fear. For I am with you. And stand firm on my promises. We'll read on here. Verse 10, it says, Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol or high as heaven. Right? But God doesn't do this very often. Right? He's, he's just promised big things to Ahaz. And he's like, you know what? If you want me to prove it? Ask me for anything. Ask me for a sign, and I will prove it to you. Verse 12. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Now, that sounds, that sounds spiritual, right? Because back in Deuteronomy, we're told, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. You know, you shouldn't ask God for, to prove himself or to, for signs and stuff. Uh, it sounds spiritual, but Ahaz is as far from spiritual as you can be. Now, you may remember on Sundays... Uh, some time back, we, we went through First and Second Kings. So we learned about Ahaz during that study. Uh, this guy was about as far from a godly king as you could be. He sacrificed his own kids to Moloch, this false god. Uh, he stripped the gold out of the temple to make a deal with, uh, with the Assyrians to protect, you know, like a protection racket kind of thing. Uh, not a spiritual guy. He just basically is just brushing everything Isaiah says off. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to bother with asking for a sign because I don't believe any of it. Verse 13 says, Then he said, Listen now, O house of David. Remember, Ahaz is, is from the line of David. And you notice he doesn't address this to Ahaz. He doesn't say, Listen now, king. Or listen now, you, Ahaz. He says, listen now, house of David. The, your entire bloodline. 
that is eventually going to bring about the Messiah. I want your whole bloodline, your, everyone who carries that name to hear this. He says, is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son. And she will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us, right? Verse 15, he will eat curds and honey. Now, to me, that sounds delicious. But at the time... This was what was considered poor people food, right? This is, this is what you get in the food stamp line or whatever, right? This, it was, you know, cheese and honey was what poor people ate. Because in all likelihood, the cheese of 700 B.C. was not, great, not the greatest quality, you know. Um, but he sa- it says he will eat curds and honey, so he's going to be poor. At the time, he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. We call that um, the age of accountability, right? That there's a lot of debate amongst people. You know, what is the age of accountability? At what age are you old enough to trust in Jesus? Right? At what age are you old enough to be baptized? Um, at what age are you old enough uh, to be accountable for yourself? So the Bible talks a little bit about this, and at the time, the standard was basically around 12 years old, because that's when you, you would have your, what we now call your bar mitzvah. You would be considered a son of the law, right? You are old enough at 12 years old. You know right and wrong. You can make some decisions. Um, but uh, if you're wondering, you know, that's, I'm not saying that 12 is the age of accountability. As a matter of fact, in um, Jonah, we're told that if you're old enough to know your right from your left, you're accountable. Although my wife struggles with that still to this day. Whenever, whenever she's giving me directions, she's like, turn left. I'm like, all right. No, left. And I'm like, this is left. No, I meant right. And I'm like, oh, why well, I, I should have known that. Anyway. <laughs> so, so he will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good uh, for before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good so before he's 12 years old right? the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken now remember we've talked about this almost every week Isaiah he deals almost exclusively with dual fulfillment prophecy, right? Almost everything he says had a meaning to the people of his time and also something in the future. Uh, and so he talks about this, this virgin is going to give birth to a child. She's going to bear a son. So this word is, is interesting, right? It, it means... Um, Someone who has not yeah, experienced sexual relations, right? Is sexually pure. But it can sometimes mean just a young woman. And so people debate about that. Are we talking about someone who, you know, literally has never had sex, so, so having a baby is, you know, kind of a miracle, right? Uh, or is it just a young woman? Uh, I think in, this, in Isaiah's time, he's talking about a young woman is going to have a baby, a literal baby during that time, and name him Emmanuel. Uh, And before that kid, before Emmanuel is a teenager, these invading kings that you're so worried worried about are going to be dealt with. Now, we're going to go to the New Testament for a second. Because remember, this is written in Hebrew. In the New Testament... Uh, Matthew 1, verse 23, Matthew quotes this verse, and, and he says this. He says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Matthew wrote 
his stuff in Greek. And the word he uses is parthenos, which can only mean a virgin the way we understand a virgin, right? He, Jesus, is, is the word made flesh, right? He is God with us. And Isaiah didn't understand that when he wrote it. That's the thing. When we read these prophecies, most of the time they didn't understand it any more than the people that were hearing it understood it. I think he understood that some girl is going to have a baby, and that baby, before he's 13, you know, the kings are going to be dealt with or whatever. But he didn't understand that he was also talking about a literal virgin 700 years later was going to have a baby. And I, I know that he didn't understand, and here's why. First Peter 1, verse 10, says this, As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries. Right? They really tried hard to understand this stuff. Verse 11, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. Verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. In these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, Sent from heaven. Things into which angels long to look. Peter says the prophets didn't always understand what they were prophesying. Even though they tried really hard, right? It's hard to understand the future. Even the angels are surprised at how God's word is fulfilled sometimes, right? They know it. They know what God has promised. And even when it comes to pass, they're like, that's what he meant? You know, they're, they're perplexed by it. They're confused by it. So, so don't, here's the reason I bring all that up. Don't stress when you don't have it all figured out. When you, you don't know what, you don't have a clear picture of the future. The angels don't. Isaiah didn't. But, but they trust God. Right? They, they stand on his promises and, and, and trust him for what they do know. Anyway, we'll move on here. Isaiah 7, uh, verse 17. It says, The Lord will bring on you, on your people, and on your father's house, such days as have never come since the day that Ephraim separated from Judah, the king of Assyria. In that day, the Lord will whistle for the fly that is in the remotest part of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria, uh, they will all come and settle on the steep ravines, on the ledges of the cliffs, on all the thorn bushes, and on all the watering places. In that day, the Lord will shave with a razor, hired from regions beyond the Euphrates, uh, that is, with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the legs, and it will also remove the beard. That's some scary stuff. Removing the beard. I almost did that here recently. I cut, I cut uh, 11 inches off my beard, and I almost shaved it, and then I went, there's a reason I grew this. I, re I remembered what I looked like without it. I'm like, eh, it's staying. Back in 2 Kings chapter 17, if you, or 16 and 17, if you want to read about it, uh, you can read about how Ahaz made a deal with Assyria, um, basically for the king of Assyria, to attack Aram and Israel, right? He knew that they were going to be attacking him, so he picked a bigger bully to pick on his bullies, right? And that king, another great name, if you've got a baby coming, uh, his name is Tiglath-Pileser. Uh, Tiglath-Pileser took the deal, uh, but he didn't stop there, right? He, he went ahead and fought those two countries, uh, verse 21, now in that day, a man may keep alive a heifer and a pair of sheep. And because of the abundance of the milk produced, he will eat curds 
for everyone that is left within the land will eat curds and honey, right? So poverty is coming, right? We're all going to be poor. Um, and so uh, Ahaz took the gold from the temple of God to pay this bully. Uh, and now your whole country is going to be broke, Ahaz, right? You, you made this deal, and now we're all going to suffer. We're all going to be broke. And so as we move into chapter 8, uh, about 10 years pass from chapter 7. Uh, and, and Emmanuel would have, be, would have been approaching that age that Isaiah talked about, right? He's getting ready for his bar mitzvah. He's not quite there. And then we'll, we're going to pick up in verse 3, Isaiah 8, verse 3. It says, so I approached the prophetess, or Mrs. Isaiah, right? his wife. Uh, and she conceived and gave birth to a son. Then the Lord said to me, Name him. <laughs> this is the longest name in the Bible. Meher Shalal Hashbaz. It's a great Bible name. Meher Shalal Hashbaz. That <laughs> it, it, it translates uh, swift is the booty, speedy is the prey. Basically, it's something wicked this way comes, is how it, another way it translates. That name means trouble is coming. With a name like Meher Shalal Hashbaz, I bet trouble came his way a lot. So God tells him, name your son this. Verse 4, for before the boy... Uh, trouble coming, uh, knows how to cry out, my father or my mother, right? So probably, what, 18 months, two years? Depends on the kid, right? But it's usually around two, they start, you can understand most of what they say. Uh, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried away before the king of Assyria. So by the time this kid is two years old, the king of Assyria will have completely defeated Aram and Samaria, the, the people that you're worried about, uh, and then he's going to turn his attention on you. Verse 5, again, the Lord spoke to me further, saying, inasmuch as these people have rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloh and rejoice in reason in the son of Ramaliah. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord is about to bring on them the strong and abundant waters of the Euphrates, right? This is this huge river that comes through uh, Assyria and, you know, dumps out into one of the valleys in Israel. Uh, Even the king of Assyria in all his glory, and it will rise up over all its channels and go over all its banks, and then it will sweep on into Judah, and it will overflow and pass through, and it will reach even to the neck. And the spread of its wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. So he says, they've rejected Shiloh, the, the calm waters of Shiloh. This is the Gihon, the, uh, the Gihon Springs that, that flow um, in Jerusalem into what later is called the Pool of uh, uh, Siloam, right? The, the pool where, uh, it's where Jesus sent the blind man, right, when he, he put some stuff in his eyes and he said, now go rinse them in this pool, uh, and be healed and back in, in John chapter 9. And that pool, it, it, it meant um, sent, where, where, the, where, uh, where one is sent. And the people, he says basically the people have rejected this, this peaceful healing water. They wouldn't come and drink of the peaceful healing waters of the sent one, the one that I sent. They wouldn't just slow down and be still and trust the Lord and drink of the peaceful, calm, healing waters of the one that I sent. They had their own plans and their own schemes. They chose that. In verse 6, it says that they, uh, they rejoiced in reason in the son of Ramaliah. So instead of seeking the Lord, uh, they actually rejoice that these, their enemies have, have been suffering and, and defeated. And that's a tough one for me, right? Like, you want your enemies to be defeated. 
But the Bible tells us that we don't rejoice in unrighteousness, right? We don't rejoice in someone else's suffering. That's not what love does. So are you, are you hustling and planning and scheming and trying to work out all the ways that you're going to fix everything? Ask yourself, can, can I slow down and really just seek the Lord in this situation? Can I wait? Can I stop being afraid and wait on the Lord? Verse 8, we're going to close out here shortly. It says, then it will sweep into Judah, right? This the river, the, the onslaught of Assyria. It will sweep into Judah. It will overflow and pass through. It will reach even to the neck. Right? The, the nation is going to fall, but the head of Jerusalem is, the head of the nation, Jerusalem, this, the holy city is going to survive. And he says, but you guys are going to be up to your neck in this. So what are you up to your neck in right now? Are you just, you're just treading water, trying to keep your head above water, just trying to keep a little bit ahead of this thing you're dealing with. It, it may seem overwhelming, but, uh, but you, you can't drown as long as your head is above water. And Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, promised that I am with you even to the end of the age, right? If he is for you, who can be against you? Verse 11, for thus the Lord spoke to me with, uh, with mighty power and instructed me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, you are not to say, oh, this was hard for me to read this week because I, I love this stuff. He says, you are not to say it is a conspiracy, in, to, in regard to all that this people call. <laughs> wow. The Lord really wants to emphasize this point. You are not to say it is a conspiracy in regard to all that this people call a conspiracy. Right? The things that everyone else is freaking out about, you're supposed to be drinking the calming, healing waters of the one that I sent. And you are not to fear what they fear or be in dread of it. It is the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy, and he shall be your fear, and he shall be your dread. Then he shall become a sanctuary, Proverbs tells us that the fear of man is a snare. It's a trap. Whom shall I fear? The Bible tells us. And Proverbs 3, I believe, says, uh, Trust in the Lord. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Just trust him. He'll be your sanctuary, Isaiah says. Your peaceful, calming, healing waters. And then the rest of verse 14 is a prophecy, again, about Jesus. Because Paul, in Romans chapter 9, and I encourage you guys to go and read these, these passages on your own. In Romans 9, Paul quotes this verse, talks a lot about it. Uh, and Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 2, refers to it. Right? So two of the apostles refer to the second half of verse 14. It says, Then he shall become a sanctuary, but to both the houses of Israel, a stone to strike or a stone of offense, and a rock to stumble over, and a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Jesus... Jesus, the one that I sent, God says through Isaiah, 
will be a stumbling block and a rock of offense to all those who reject him. It's going to be the thing that matters most. When you stand before the Lord, did you reject my son or not? Did you trust him or not? That's all I care about. Verse 15, many will stumble over them. And then they will fall and be broken. They will even be snared and caught. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. And I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will even look eagerly for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and wonders in Israel. Right? He says, God gave me two sons with weird names so that I would walk around and constantly have this thing to talk to people about, to talk about the Lord. Uh, for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. Uh, verse 19, when they say to you, consult the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people consult their God? He says, when the, all the people who are afraid and freaking out and they say, we should turn to this and we should turn to that. He says, no, you should turn to your God. Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. Isaiah says, the answer is to the law and the testimony, to God's word. I'm going to go to the Bible. I'm going to go to the word made flesh, God with us. I'm going to, I'm going to go to that instead of all the things they're pointing me toward. And he says, uh, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. They don't have the light inside them. So why seek our counsel from the secular when we have a, a living God? And we're running long, so I'll, I'll leave it at this. He says, to the law, to the testimony, right? To the Bible, to the thing we've been reading for this last 35 minutes or so. Uh, Emmanuel left us a manual. Okay? You've got something. You're up to your neck in something right now. And you're probably looking for some, some advice, some counsel. He left you a manual to the law, to the testimony. That's where your answer is. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for uh, allowing us to gather together to, to read your law and testimony tonight. Uh, Lord, whatever, um, whatever it is that we've been turning to ahead of you, Lord, let us lay that aside. And God, we just pray that you give us discernment and wisdom make our path straight help us see what our next move is and let that move be one that brings us closer to you we pray you come and come quickly we pray this in jesus name and all god's people said amen all right ready break <laughs>